Right. Um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Scrap GDAM's Realizing Global Disarmament webinar. My name is David Franco and I am Scrap's project coordinator. Joining me today we have Karina Solmerano from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute or CIPRI. Hi Karina. Hi. Um, Yeshua Moser Puang Suwon from the International Peace Bureau or IPB. Hello Yeshua. Hey David. Um, Gabriela Ersten from Rich and Critical Wheel, also calling from Geneva. Hi, Gab Gabriela. Hello. And uh, to my right, I have Ian Shields, an expert in climate and energy policy, uh, member of the UK Chief of Defence Staff Strategic Forum and a research associate at the UK uh, Defence Forum. Hello, everybody. Um, finally, also with us today and behind the cameras, we have uh, members of the SCRAP team who have greatly contributed throughout the year to help make Scrap a reality and not just a slogan. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining me today. Now, uh, for, the, uh, for those of you joining um, outside through our streaming uh, facility in the CISD website, just to let you know if the uh, stream fails, please just uh, refresh um, the, site, the website and click on the watch button again. So now, before I formally hand over to our speakers, I want to say a few things about today's webinar and the SCRAP project. Um, April 17th is an important date. Um, this morning, CIPRI released uh, data uh, corresponding to the world's military spending um, in 2011. To coincide with CIPRI's release data, the International Peace Bureau has um, an organization, sorry, that's been fighting for uh, peace for over a century and um, which, um, was awarded the Nobel Laureate in 1910, has uh, for the second consecutive year co-organized um, the uh, Global Day of Action on Military Spending, or GDAMS as, is it, as it is otherwise known, and uh, for which they have called friend organizations, campaigns, movements around the world to uh, join in a unison cry to, um, for sorry, uh, disarmament and international peace. Now, of course, we at SCRAP uh, did not want to miss out on the occasion and um, hence today's SCRAP uh, GDAMS webinar. Last week, I wrote and published an article in Open Democracy um, where I said that CIPRI's data um, corresponding to 2011 would most likely tell us uh, that governments and the military industrial complex continue to do business as usual, thus fostering conflict and war um, around the globe. Um, in a few minutes, Karina will, will tell us uh, more about CIPRI's data for 2011. But um, having had a glimpse over it myself, I want to say a few things. Um, total military spending for 2011 has been uh, estimated at 1,738 billion US dollars. That is just 0.3% more than in 2010 when measured in, in real terms. Um, CIPRI has quantified this as unchanged data when compared to last year, to 2010 and notes that um, this data breaks a 13-year run of continuous military spending um, increases. So was I wrong when I uh, wrote that governments and private companies continue to do business as usual? Well, military spending may not have increased uh, much from last year, but it has not decreased either. Um, if anything, it has stopped a growing spending tendency in absolute terms. Uh, mostly due to economic constraints and spending cuts in the main traditional powers, plus Brazil and India, um, but not in Russia, China, Africa, and the Middle East. Furthermore, despite the global economic recession, the arms industry continues to boom with arms transfers, increasing a 24% um, over the past five years. So as CIPRI has acknowledged in today's release of data, it is all too early to say whether the flattening of military spending for 2011 um, represents a long-term change or not. Also, let us not forget that any major new war or conflict could uh, change the picture dramatically and that the current level of arms spread around the globe um, makes conflict and war more, not less, probable. So what can we do to stop uh, military spending, arms transfers, conflict and war? GDAMS, no doubt, is a good start. Um, so is CIPRI's and other organizations and movements continued research on military spending, nuclear weapons costs, and so on. Uh, but for us to turn slogans into actual action and for us to turn action into fair agreements, we need proposals. And this is what SCRAP is about. Uh, for those of you who do not know much about SCRAP, SCRAP stands for Strategic Concept 
for removal of arms and proliferation. And in short, it is a strategic and holistic project on global disarmament that proposes uh, the adoption of an international legally binding agreement for general and complete disarmament with a 10-year implementation period from, agreement, from the date of the agreement. I know we've heard it before. Um, some may think that this is utopian. Um, some may think this is impossible or that we don't stand a chance. However, at Scrap, we are guided uh, by numerous precedents and serious reasons that make us believe um, that general and complete disarmament is not only necessary but also possible. If you told someone uh, in the past that the, U the US and Soviet Union would reach agreement on the elimination of a whole range um, of intermediate and short-range uh, nuclear missiles, they would have thought you, you know, that person was insane. The same reaction ensued if you told someone that Europeans um, would scrap more than 60,000 tanks um, and establish top ceilings in their, for their conventional forces. Um, and yet both treaties, the U.S. Soviet Intermediate Forces Nuclear Forces Treaty and the European Conventional Forces Treaty were signed at the end of the 80s and uh, at the start of the 90s. Um, add to this the START treaties, the Open Skies Treaty, the Confidence Security Building Process initiated in Vienna, the Biological and Chemical Conventions, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and the conventions to ban landmines and cluster munitions. Um, all were deemed unrealistic at some point, that yet they, they all became real. Uh, today, much more can and must be done. And like in the past, we will be told it is impossible. Our task, the task of those guided uh, and engaged in disarmament, uh, is to tell and show how we can make this possible. Now, I don't want to go much into the technical details of SCRAP, um, but I will nonetheless make uh, three brief points. Conceptually, SCRAP is based on the premise that there is at present a, an overarching framework on general and complete disarmament, and that the absence of such a frame, framework is problematic at various levels. Uh, in particular, we believe it is hindering um, progress on regional issues, um, as regional actors ask, why them, when there are no similar initiatives at the global level? Uh, secondly, from a strategic standpoint, SCRAP um, focuses on three mutually reinforcing areas, nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction, conventional and humanitarian disarmament. Uh, nuclear disarmament remains a priority, um, but as noted in numerous occasions and uh, numerous disarmament resolutions and treaties, conventional disarmament can foster uh, security and ultimately lead the path to nuclear disarmament. It is also an answer to those that see nuclear disarmament a way of perpetrating conventional um, supremacy. As per humanitarian disarmament, we ask the following question. Aren't humanitarian concerns also applicable to conventional and nuclear um, weapons? So at SCRAP, we offer a proposal to globalize the effective uh, disarmament mechanisms and protocols covered in a range of end of the Cold War treaties, as well as um, in uh, certain various mechanisms and regimes uh, concerning verification uh, found in the early 90s. Um, unfortunately, those agreements um, have been rapidly forgotten and were usually presented with the supposed intractable step-by-step -step, uh, process, uh, when in the past rapid progress has been achieved and made by working in parallel on several different uh, topics. So, based on past achievements, uh, we propose at SCRAP that disarmament could happen within a decade from agreement. And this, we argue, is much easier when compared um, to the challenges presented by climate change. And uh, I'm sure Ian may be able to comment on that later on. Um, but thirdly, and most importantly, for the purposes of uh, the webinar today, uh, SCRAP is a global project, not only in the sense that it seeks WMD conventional and humanitarian disarmament on a global scale, but also in the sense that it seeks to build a campaign, a global campaign, in support for disarmament by applying a global frame centered on the concept of human security, as opposed to pervasive approaches to security centered on national interests, and uh, one may add, <coughs> excuse me, on the interests of multinational companies and individuals um, engaged in the arms industry. Hence, here at SCRAP, we believe that today disarmament can no longer be addressed in isolation from other related and interlinked fields, in particular development, human rights, and climate change. And this is precisely um, what, we, what we want to address in today's webinar. Realizing the global disarmament, we argue, is necessary and possible. 
Now, for the next 15 minutes to an hour, we will hear four presentations from experts in their respective fields. Uh, then we will open up for questions and a Q&A uh, live debate uh, towards the end. I would like to remember members of the audience that they can send us uh, their questions through social media or by email to our Gmail account, uh, details of which can be found in the uh, webinar event page, uh, where they're actually watching this now. Um, so without further ado, I will now hand over on to Karina Solmerano, who's a researcher with the CIPRI Military Expenditure Project, responsible for monitoring military expenditure in Latin America, the Middle East, and South Asia. Prior to joining CIPRI, Karina worked at the jo Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, where she's a doctoral candidate. She's also worked on arms control issues at the Argentine NGO Asociación para Políticas Públicas, and as an advisor at the Argentine Senate. Karina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. Uh, well, you pointed um, uh, very well at the beginning, saying that it looks like governments continue doing business as usual. Um, it is true that during 2011, uh, military spending came to a stop uh, at $1.7 trillion. You know, this trend uh, indicates that for now, the cycle of continuous increases that we saw since 1998 might have uh, slowed down uh, or come to a stop. But again, we want to be cautious about this. We want to, um, um, in one way, we want to um, not to create expectations that this might uh, start a new trend of falling uh, military spending. We, I think we will need to see um, how the greater powers uh, behave in the next coming years to determine whether um, we have come to an end of um, accelerated growth of military spending worldwide. However, one of the main reasons why military spending has not changed in 2011 is because finally the financial crisis uh, caught some of the largest economies, and especially in the US and in Western Europe. So the panorama in 2011 looked like this. Uh, the United States um, spent about $711 billion. This is, this is still a, a huge number, uh, but this was actually a decrease of 1.2% in real terms. This is after inflation. Uh, and this is the first fall, actually, since 1998 in the United States. Uh, it is expected that uh, further cuts will happen in the, in the next coming years. Um, and this is mainly um, because of two factors. Uh, the first um, is the withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Iraq and the gradual reduction of the military presence uh, in Afghanistan. Um, which means that um, war spending um, will be less uh, in, the next, uh, in the next years. Um, and this will be the case if the United States continue with the plan uh, of withdrawing troops uh, from uh, Afghanistan by 2014. Uh, the second factor driving this, this falling trend in the United States right now is, is the deficit crisis that the United States is having um, um, nowadays. Um, as you probably have been following, the, United, uh, the, the Congress passed um, a new bill, a new budget uh, law, requiring um, a certain amount of cuts um, uh, to address uh, the high deficit and the, and, the, and the debt that the United States uh, government have, has in these in this moments. And so it is expected that um, in the next um, 10 years, approximately, uh, the defense uh, budget will be cut in about $487 billion. Um, we hope that uh, actually these this cuts uh, will be implemented because, uh, like you mentioned before, um, unless there is a, a war in which the United States uh, would engage in the future, uh, these cuts would, uh, would be necessary to address uh, the, the economic problems um, of the United States. The second um, region that saw uh, the effects of the financial crisis was uh, Europe, and especially Western Europe. Um, as, you, as you probably are very aware, some of the smaller economies um, of Central Europe were, were very much affected, but also Southern Europe. Um, and this is the case, for instance, with Greece, 
which uh, saw a cut of 26% uh, in 2011, um, Spain with an uh, 18%, Italy uh, 16%, and Ireland um, 11%. Uh, it's not coincidental that these four countries have been uh, suffering the effects of, of the financial crisis and, and have been um, implementing austerity measures that have been really harsh on, on the population. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why they needed to also address um, immediately these cuts in defense. But also the largest spenders in Europe, uh, the, Uni the, the United Kingdom, France and Germany, have started to reduce spending and they are planning in the next uh, coming years to continue doing so. Uh, perhaps at a slower rate, but nevertheless, uh, the panorama looks like uh, as if Europe will go towards um, a falling trend in terms of military spending. Um, this is the, the this is the the, the picture where where um, we have a contrast um, situation with those countries that actually increased military spending during 2011. Uh, Russia is an example of that. Um, Russia had a, um, a growth of 9.3% in 2011, and it reached a total of almost $72 billion. Um, this has placed Russia as the third largest uh, military spender in the world, uh, over, overtaking the United uh, Kingdom and France. Russia is nowadays embarked in, um, in a long-term modernization program that involves uh, further increases uh, in the future. And one example of this is that uh, they have uh, planned to spend uh, $749 billion on equipment, uh, research and development, and support for the arms and military service industry um, from uh, 2011 until 2020. This is, this is again a massive number. Um, and this would allow Russia to actually update uh, almost 70% of its inventory, uh, its weapons inventory, uh, that um, dates back to the Soviet um, times. Um, China is the second um, country that uh, saw an increase uh, during 2011, uh, 6.3 in real terms. And China is the second largest um, um, spender in the world at $143 billion. Um, and since 2002, it's, it's, um, it, it has grown rapidly at a, at a pace of 170% uh, increase in, in real terms. China is uh, trying to, uh, again, like, like uh, in a very similar fashion to Russia, to modernize its, its armed forces, its military. Um, but it's also been uh, increasing military spending in, in line with its own economic growth. Um, and so that's why, for instance, the share as a GDP has been kept around the 2% during all these years. Um, China is trying to, uh, again, uh, acquire new equipment and, uh, and become also um, um, a stronger competitors in the arms industry. Um, is trying to improve also the conditions of, of uh, its troops and uh, increase, uh, for, for example, uh, the salaries uh, for, for the army. Um, but it's also, I guess, um, um, part of uh, the, the Chinese um, goal to become a, um, a greater power um, and have a better or larger role in international politics. And so, in this regard, they need to have uh, not only economic power, but also uh, military capabilities to support this economic power. And this is, is in general terms, the picture uh, of the greater powers um, in, in 2011. In other regions of the world, we, ha we have seen a little bit of uh, variations. Latin America is one very interesting case because up until last year, uh, Latin America was one of the regions that had uh, the largest growth in terms of military spending. Um, and this year, because Brazil cut its military spending, uh, the overall uh, um, expenditure in Latin America dropped by 3.3%. Um, one of the countries that increased uh, in the region was Mexico. As you know, Mexico is uh, right now engaged in a, um, um, in a conflict or in a war, um, although the war, the world, um, war on drugs is, is, is Kind of um, um, 
not the appropriate one, but um, they are uh, engaging the military in counter-narcotic operations. And so they have increased since 2002 their military spending by 52% as well. Um, the Middle East uh, is another region where uh, this year uh, there was um, um, not a large increase, but, um, but a significant one at 4.6%. Um, uh, but with the Middle East, what happens is that there's a, a high uncertainty in the estimates because um, data for some of the largest players is missing. Um, for instance, we don't, um, we don't have data for Iran uh, and the UAE, uh, which are, which are um, extremely um, important players in the region. Um, one thing about the Middle East is that um, the increases that we saw during 2011 uh, do not seem to be related to the so-called Arab Spring, not at least for the moment, um, because these budgets were approved before the uprisings. And so I think that um, maybe in 2012 or in 2013, uh, we, might, we might see if the Arab Spring had any type of impact uh, on, on the militaries uh, in the region. And finally, in, in, in Africa, um, we saw also an increase um, that was mainly um, driven by Algeria, um, which increased its military spending considerably, uh, partially in response to the Libya conflict, um, but also because they have um, engaged in a, in a large uh, rearmament program um, and today, um, just to give you an idea, Algeria is the seventh largest important, uh, importer of uh, major conventional weapons. Um, they have um, high revenues from oil and gas that have made possible for Algeria to actually afford this increase and to continue modernizing uh, its military. And so, like, like I said, you know, the, the, the regional and global picture um, presents interesting, interesting uh, variations. I think that although the United States uh, uh, has decreased uh, slightly its military spending, uh, there's no question that it remains and it will remain for the foreseeable future, I guess, the, the most um, important military power. Um, China and Russia will try to continue modernizing their armies. They, they, they are expected to continue increasing military spending in, in, uh, in the next years, like I said before. So the picture in 2012 might be, might be a little bit different to the one that we have today. And especially, especially if, uh, if a potential conflict in the Middle East will, will, uh, will emerge. Um, but one thing that um, you know, I want to sort of remark is that this number that, um, that I said at the beginning, the $1.74 trillion that the world spends on military spending, is a number that, that we need to put in the context and in, in perhaps in a perspective that, that might help us understand a little bit what we are talking about. Just to give you an idea, and with this I would like to, to close my remarks, um, the total annual cost of achieving uh, the Millennium Development Goals is about 20% of that number. So with that number, the, the, the goals would be fulfilled by 2015. I think this, this might have a tremendous impact uh, to the poorer in the world. Um, but still, you know, we don't see any, any indication that, that countries are shifting their priorities. They continue doing business as usual, I guess. Thank you very much, David. Thanks very much, Karina, for a very insightful um, presentation. I think you've raised very interesting points, um, and I'd like to highlight, for example, the trend towards military rebalancing somehow. Um, the fact, uh, the increase in military spending in the Middle East not fostered, um, at least in principle, not fostered by the Arab Spring in Africa, the rise uh, of military spending by Algeria um, due to that conflict in Libya. And um, I'd like to end uh, you know, my, my remarks here with your final um, point about the Millennium Development Goals and how the annual cost of achieving those by 2015 is about a 20% of the total annual military spending in the world. Mm.
So thanks very much, Karina. Um, our next, our next uh, speaker is uh, Yeshua Moser Puang Suun. Um, he's a consultant at the International Peace Bureau, and he's also one of the editors of the Landmine and Cluster Munition Monitor Report uh, for the international campaign to ban landmines, and he sits on the International Program uh, Council of the Small Arms Survey. Um, at, I, at the IPB, Yeshua has been involved in implementing the D4D, or otherwise known as Disarmament and Development Program. Uh, Yeshua, the micro is yours. Thank you, David. And first, let me say how, how pleased uh, the International Peace Bureau is that uh, SOAS and uh, SCRAPS has, has made this contribution to the uh, Global Day on Military Spending, uh, Global Day of Action on Military Spending. Uh, there are almost 140 events going on around the globe during this week on this. And uh, I'm not surprised when Karina said before uh, this webinar started that there had already been a thousand news items on their release only a few hours earlier today. This is an issue that has been important to, um, to human beings for a very long time. I was at the United Nations building here in Geneva yesterday, and they have a display on the World Disarmament Conference of 1930. And many of the issues that are being ra were raised at that conference are the same ones that we're focusing on uh, in the Global Day Against Military Spending. Um, so this issue, this tension in society between expenditures on the military and social expenditures has been around for quite a long time. Uh, CIPRI's work, which we have coordinated this day of action on, um, is the key non-governmental transparency effort to bring some light to this. For disarmament activists in too many countries, it is still dangerous for them to ask about military expenditures in their country. It's a military secret. In many of our other countries, we're told that we shouldn't know this information for our own good. Um, and so the, the transparency that CIPRI brings to this is incredibly important. But there are several things that aren't included in, in the CIPRI figures. Uh, not only can they not get all countries, as, as Karina mentioned, um, but uh, also the debts from past wars that saddle uh, many countries and the way in which military expenditures get hidden and farmed out into other parts of the budget and are hard to, hard to see. So the figure that CIPRI comes up with is a figure that nobody should uh, have a problem using because it doesn't cover everything. The expenditures that we have in human society on the military are, are much greater than that. Um, the other transparency effort is the, the uh, UN uh, register on military expenditures that they invite uh, countries to make submissions to. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of countries do not participate in that, uh, or they have in the past sent in reports that were not comparable, and it's very difficult to get good data out of that. Uh, the UN started that transparency effort to support general and complete disarmament, um, but they have stepped back from that now and are saying, well, this is really a trust-building effort. And uh, trust is something that's really lacking in the world today, but um, we think that the problem is deeper than that, and it's one of militarism in our human societies. The belief that the use of force is expected and okay in international relations. Um, and that is something that we are, are challenging with GDAMs. You could see it as the Occupy Military Expenditures Movement. Um, uh, Karina mentioned the Millennium Development Goals as the main consensus that we have on meeting social needs in human society today. And the, the amount of the military budget that that would cover is, is not really known either because we just don't know how much it's going to cost to meet those goals until we've done it. Uh, the World Bank, UNDP, the Millennium Development Commission have all come out with different estimates as to how much it would cost. Um, and it could be up to um, a half or three quarters of last year's military expenditures as were tracked by, by CIPRI. Um, 
the UN budget fits into a minuscule amount of that. The UN budget for the last year uh, was one one hundredth of that, uh, one one hundredth of a percent of that expenditure. Think of the refugees that are serviced by UNHCR, the child and maternal uh, programs of UNICEF, the cultural programs of UNESCO, the development work of UNDP, the, re, uh, the work on war-torn countries by UN OCHA, the huge offices that they have in U uh, the New York, Geneva, Vienna, all of that one one hundredth of that figure. I mean, these figures get really difficult to grasp, and I, I created one that was very real to me in our movement to ban landmines. Uh, we started our movement in 1992, and up to 2009, we raised and spent $34 million on our advocacy efforts. And during that time, we've had some notable successes. We brought about the 1997 mine ban treaty, and since that time, the number of weapons that have been destroyed has increased every year. The amount of ground that's been cleared of landmines has increased every year. And the number of victims of these weapons has dropped every year. So we can say it's successful. That money that we spend over a 15-year period is spent in two and a half hours by the US Marines in Afghanistan on fuel. Uh, if you add in the figure for humanitarian demining, uh, which is the actual clearing of the mines out of the ground, and we've cleared about 3,200 square kilometers of land of anti-personnel mines, that cost $4.2 billion, equivalent to 13 days fuel use by the U.S. Marines in Afghanistan. Now, do we feel as a human society we're getting more good for humankind out of clearing 3,200 square kilometers of land? or 13 days worth of activity by the US Marines in Afghanistan. The International Campaign to Ban Landmines believes we're about halfway through the problem. We think there's about 3,000 3, square kilometers yet left to clear. Um, so that means we actually know how much it's going to take to clear an enormous human problem. If we could transfer the costs of one month's worth of fuel use by the U.S. Marines in Afghanistan, we would have eliminated the landmine problem from the face of the planet. Think about how much human suffering we would have avoided by doing that. It, it's a no-brainer. I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Yeshua. I think you've raised uh, very interesting points and questions as well. And, uh, I would highlight two of them. Uh, one is the lack of transparency in many states uh, when it comes to uh, providing data relating to their military spending. And I think that goes at the core of something we were discussing before um, kicking off the seminar here, which is the relationship between military spending and the lack of democratic development, um, precisely in, in states or countries which are deemed to be, in principle, um, democratic, of course, the term democracy has lost a lot of value these days. And the second point uh, you, I want to highlight um, uh, from your remarks is the social and human costs of military spending. Um, and I think I'll leave it there because you've raised very interesting questions that we can address later on during our debate. Um, so thanks again, Yeshua. Uh, our next speaker um, is Gabriela Erston from Reaching Critical Wheel who will talk to us about disarmament and human rights. Gabriela is a project associate for Reaching Critical Wheel um, based in Geneva, where together with the rest of her team, they monitor and analyze a wide range of um, disarmament negotiations at the UN. Amongst other, Gabriela participated recently in delivering a statement by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom at the Conference on Disarmament on uh, Women's Day. Um, advocating for the need to address disarmament and hu uh, in conjunction, sorry, with human rights. Gabriela, um, your turn. Thank you so much. Um, I would just quickly like to uh, mention what Reaching Critical Will does and the relation to will, because it seems to confuse people a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Reaching Critical Will is the disarmament project of Women's National League for Peace and Freedom. It was created in 99. 1999, sorry, uh, and it's a project that's supposed to promote and facilitate 
engagements for non-governmental actors in the UN uh, disarmament processes. Um, as all of the previous speakers have uh, mentioned, with the new CIPRI release um, figures, you can see that it is business as usual, which is um, interesting since um, if we look at if we look at how fast it took states to um, start cutting down on social welfare um, um, uh, finance finances, um, these recent num numbers from CIPRI shows that there's uh, no such cuts are being made in the military spending, and they remain unaffected. And uh, this mismanagement of resources that the states are uh, distributing have become even more clear uh, now since 2008 with the financial crisis. Uh, it's also clear we've had a discussion on democracy. Uh, it's also clear that even though many states that promote themselves as advocates for international peace and uh, security and claim to promote uh, international disarmament uh, are the same ones that we can see in Cyprus number are the same ones that are the biggest military spenders and also the major actors in international arms trade. And thereby, they are contributing to fueling conflict, human rights violation, and uh, disrupting peace processes. Um, I have an example that I've taken from another Cypri uh, report that was released earlier this year uh, that states that uh, although the uh, the U.S. reviewed its uh, arms transfer policies in 2011. They still remain the major supplies of uh, military equipment for Tunisia and Egypt, and Russia the same thing for um, Syria. Um, and you see, with, the, with this development and also looking at the multilateral disarmament process within the U.N. that has long been working in complete isolation from other U.N. organs, uh, and where many member states believe that uh, including an aspect like human rights is completely irrelevant in the disarmament for us. Um, uh, we have here at Teaching Critical Will um, started to emphasize trying to work how to uh, include human rights aspect and humanitarian aspect in these for us. And we think it's very important to realize that, first of all, disarmament is not a goal in itself. It's a tool that we should use to uh, pursue global sustainable peace. And therefore, it cannot um, work in isolation or in a vacuum from today's realities. Um, and it needs to be addressed from multiple angles. Um, it's also clear that multilateral disarmament for us are not contributing right now um, as they should be uh, to the global, global sustainable peace. Um, they're not moving forward. So there's no this speaking about UN disarmament uh, for us. They're not moving forward in substantive uh, work and uh, they don't really integrate humanitarian approach, the humanitarian approach. So what we do in our work, we try to look at the weapon and military expenditure uh, in reality, the bigger picture of human security and human rights. And the national security argument that's usually being used by states to arm is not directly today, does not directly automatically mean human security. And in many cases, it's the opposite, where the state is the violator of human rights. And we also have other problems with this traditional call for national security. Uh, when you look at the, today's warfare and how it's changed, then it's no longer state-on-state -state war. It's more uh, civil unrest. It's happening among civilians, by civilians. And these wars or conflicts are fueled by the lack of resources and lack of human needs being met and also hu uh, human rights being violated. Uh, so therefore, it shows that these increases or these amount of um, amount of dollars that they are putting into weapons and military uh, does not guarantee secure, uh, human security today. Uh, and especially not if you see that there's a limited resources and putting it to militarism instead of social spending um, is literally directly taking 
uh, resources away from humans. Um, so we believe that uh, disarmament measures should contribute to preventing armed conflicts and preventing violation of human rights and seriously reducing the culture and, and economics of military. And we therefore argue that um, the, the disarmament Disarmament should not only be uh, dealt with in traditional disarmament fora. They should, uh, there are topics that should be considered in the entire range of the UN uh, mechanism and bodies that seek to establish human security and sustainable development. Um, and also today, when we see that the UN uh, disarmament fora are not uh, contributing to this. Uh, sustainable peace. We need to find other measures how to do this. So we have established four, uh, we identified four different areas within human rights law and international humanitarian law where we were safe to uh, held, be held responsible and uh, of their weapon proliferation and military expenditure and where NGOs and civil society should uh, work to include disarmament and weapons in an ongoing discussion. And these four areas are, the first one deals with genocide, and uh, that the known uh, civilian death toll for uh, a nuclear attack could, uh, could be used and could, uh, for the criteria of genocide. And looking at the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where hundreds of thousands of people were killed, uh, we think this argument is clear, and therefore a potential nuclear weapon attack should be included in discussion of genocide. We also have the um, argument of environment, but I'm just briefly going to touch upon that because I think that the follow uh, presentation will deal with that much better. And uh, so, aside from that, the military is one of the biggest polluters uh, on our planet. It's also, um, in particularly, a, a um, a catastrophe if a nuclear weapon attack would help on health and environment. And recent studies have shown that if it would be a regional nuclear, weapon, nuclear war between Pakistan and India, and they would only use 50 nuclear weapons each, this would cause a global famine that could kill over 1 billion people. And then we have the cost area. And so the cost of continue to renew and deploy and maintain all the different weapon systems uh, should be put in relation to budget available for, to fulfill human re uh, rights obligations. And this is also anchored in the UN Charter by Article 26 that directly addresses a military uh, expenditure and it would, it would be applied. It would um, immediately reduce resources away from military expenditure uh, and into towards human security, including education and health and so on. Uh, we also have Article 2.1 of the International Convent, Convent on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that states that every state party should undertake uh, steps, especially economic and technical, to the maximum of the available resources with a view to achieving progressively full realization of the rights recognized in the present covenant by all appropriate means. This was also re-established in the Maastricht guidelines, um, which state that any violation of these economic, social and cultural rights clarifies that is in violation of the covenant if it fails to allocate, if it fails to allocate maximum of available resources, resources to uh, realizing human rights. Our fourth is regarding uh, responsibility to protect. I don't know if I should maybe quickly. That's all right. Uh, should, uh, should I quickly uh, explain what responsibility to protect is? Uh, please go uh, ahead. Yes, we're within within time, so that's fine. So that to quickly try to sum it up, responsibility to protect is a norm or a set of principles uh, that is based that on the idea that sovereignty of states is not. A privilege it's a responsibility and that um and it's focused on preventing and uh, halting for crimes such as genocide war crimes crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing and it has three uh, three different pillars and our uh, argument deals with the prevention pillar um 
So to hold export countries responsible for arms sale to countries where the, it is a reasonable or foreseeable um, law, uh, foreseeable that violence of human rights law and international humanitarian law will occur, should be related to the doctrine of responsibility for text. And this doctrine should be invoked to prevent states uh, to export arms to regions where violation of human rights uh, are documented or where conflict is likely or where it's reasonable foreseeable that a type of arms would be used on the civil, the civil population, civilian population. Um, and we also believe that real protection, protection of uh, humans can only be realized through prevention. And that's why this responsibility to protect the prevention pillar is important. So um, at Reaching Critical World, we believe that disarmament processes, if there's time for disarmament processes, to promote and protect human rights and international humanitarian law. And we believe that one way forward is to hold states responsible for their action and obligation. Uh, and by doing this, and we should do this by incorporating disarmament into human rights treaty bodies, where they should be addressed by special rapporteurs and special procedures, and eventually, eventually go in and be tackled by the Human Rights Council and its um, universal periodic review. And we have seen this, this has been mentioned also from prior speakers. We've seen uh, that these arguments have been successful in uh, banning landmines and cluster munitions. It's just it's specifically the humanitarian effects of these weapons that have helped to ban these weapons. We have also wit witnessed a change in the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear disarmament doctrines among states, civil society, and now recently international um, uh, Red Cross, the National Committee of the Red Cross, uh, they're slowly starting to recognize the truly indiscriminate of these weapons and the gross humanitarian consequence that would take place if they would be used. And this an example could also be seen in the 2010 Non-Proliferation Treaty final outcome document where this language was incorporated. Uh, and yes, that is what we're working on at Reaching Critical Will. Thanks very much, Gabriella, for a very rich presentation. You've raised a lot of points there. You were cutting off um, at some points, uh, but hopefully people, I mean, it wasn't very serious, so hopefully people will have been able to, to follow you. Um, I'll, I, was, I was going to, I, I liked uh, that you mentioned, well, you started your presentation by saying that uh, states are not uh, quite implementing the cuts in military spending as they are perhaps implementing cuts in other areas of social welfare, for example. Um, you also mentioned the contribution of arms transfers uh, to human rights violations in many cases from states themselves who acquire those weapons, who import those weapons. Um, you stressed the importance of addressing human rights and disarm or in conjunction to, with disarmament and not to address disarmament in traditional fora but in the entire UN system. Um, you also, you also sorry, highlighted four areas that you have identified at Reaching Critical Wheel as um, critical, if I may use the word again, um, in human rights law and uh, international humanitarian law, uh, dealing with uh, genocide, environment, costs, and responsibility to protect. Um, now, I'm sure we can discuss um, much more of this when time comes in the Q&A session towards the end. And, uh, I, I was reading through the questions that uh, members of the audience have sent us, and there's a couple to do with uh, human rights, so we can discuss that uh, there. Uh, also, something that I wanted to say, somehow you have indirectly linked with Karina's presentation. Uh, Karina highlighted the military rebalancing uh, that we're seeing. Um, I think it is important to note that in many cases, um, arms transfers, uh, whilst, whilst military spending is going down in certain countries, especially countries hit by the global economic recession, especially in the West, we see how arms transfers are going the other way. Uh, in, in many, in major states, um, it may be like, for example, China um, has developed its own indigenous industry uh, in some areas, uh, but in other cases, uh, countries, uh, non-developed countries are important, those weapons from industrialized countries. Um, and when it comes to responsibility to protect, 
you uh, have mentioned, you know, the need to actually prot protect before the conflict arises. And one way of doing that is by, by not selling arms to unstable regions. Um, so I think it's important to note that. Uh, so we just, uh, I think we're, we're running well in time. So um, our next speaker, as I mentioned earlier, is Ian Shields, um, who's sitting here to my right. I hope um, he's well framed in the, in the camera screen. Um, Ian uh, is an expert, as I said, in global climate and energy policy. And he collaborates amongst other universities with the uh, SOAS Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, where he teaches a module in one of the AMA programs here. He's also a member of the UK Chief of the Defence Staff Strategic Forum and Research Associate at the UK Defence Forum. Um, Ian is going to talk to us about the relationship between military spending and the environment. Ian? Thank you very much, David. I should perhaps start off with a few disclaimers. Um, I'm reminded of the uh, Duke of Wellington surveying the field at Waterloo when he said there's only one thing sadder than a battle lost, and that's a battle won. Um, I say this because uh, I'm in a slightly different position to my uh, fellow three speakers on this panel, in as much as I actually have a military background. I spent 32 years in the military. Um, I have seen a nuclear weapon. I was actually trained at one point to drop them. So I speak um, uh, perhaps from a slightly different viewpoint. Um, I have no difficulty uh, with this because I firmly believe that uh, for those who, who truly want to understand war and conflict, um, uh, you can only do so if you have actually be, been a participant in it, willing or otherwise. So having uh, set my stall out, I'm going to look at the relationship, as David said, between disarmament and climate change. And I really want to make three broad points. Um, the first is uh, that, I want, that I would like to reinforce what both David and Gabriella have said in their comments and say that we need to look anew at what we mean by security. And I think we need to drastically broaden uh, what we mean by security and uh, spread the debate much wider. Secondly, I would like to suggest that there's a direct environmental threat by not disarming. And this point has, again, been touched on by other speakers. And the third point I want to make towards the end is the potential for climate change mitigation by disarming. So let me start off with the first of these uh, three points, what we understand by security in its broadest sense. And again, as Gabriella and David have both hinted already, um, our traditional view of security is very state-centric. It is based on hard power, it is based on uh, force between nations, um, which is now being uh, challenged by new perceptions of what we mean by security. Um, we see threats much more transnational. If they are transnational, how can nations operating individually or even in coalitions hope realistically to counter them? <coughs> I would suggest that when you look at security challenges around the world, and I notice that ma many security analysts these days use the word conflict rather than war, because war is very much tied to interstate conflict, what we see is far more about policing. We're, we're far more interested um, in, in things such as uh, conflict resolution, such as nation building. We are interested, in, indeed, in terms of anti-terrorism as much as a police action as a military action. All of this suggests that there is a far greater role for what military uh, analysts refer to as soft power rather than hard power. So the role of diplomacy and of disarmament becomes more pressing when we look at the new way of regarding security. I would go one step further in these uh, first comments and say that the uh, very notion of the state itself and therefore using the state both as an actor um, in terms of conflict and an actor for solving problems is fundamentally being challenged and undermined by the threat of globalization. And I'll return to globalization in just a few moments' time. When we look forward just 20 or 30 years, and certainly no further forward than 40 years, uh, most analysts based in ministries of defense or departments of defense um, in the, uh, what we might term the developed world, 
um, all come up with a very similar analysis of the threats we are facing and certainly work uh, in the United Kingdom, the US, Canada, and Japan, amongst other places, have identified three major drivers for future conflict and therefore security threats. The first of these, and this again has been touched on, not least by Gabriella, is global inequality, and how poverty itself is a threat multiplier. The second is the, is the issue of globalization and how globalization is undermining uh, uh, the traditional view of security and making this interconnected, interdependent world more secure in some respects, but equally damaging, less secure. And the third threat that um, all these think tanks all agree upon, and the one that I'm going to concentrate on, is climate change, and how climate change is, however you care to define security, a security threat. Why might it be a security threat? I'll give you a number of examples. The first one is that um, those areas around the world that's, that are most prone to the negative impacts of climate change are very often the same areas where poverty is rampant, where hu human development is, is low, and where the quality of life is very poor. Moreover, they tend to be in areas where there have traditionally been large-scale conflicts, if not large-scale in terms of numbers, then in terms of time. So climate change, as with poverty, acts as a threat multiplier. Let me give you another example. For those who believe that climate change is not a security threat to a country such as the UK, let us consider what would happen if, if uh, sea levels rose by about two metres. Where we are sitting today in the city of London, uh, or on the edge of the city technically, we would be under considerable threat. However, thanks to technology such as the Thames Barrier, we may be able to hold back the, uh, the impact of this, uh, uh, of this rise in sea level. A similar rise in sea level uh, in Bangladesh would have a devastating impact on the low-lying crop-producing areas of that country. This is, surprise, surprise, a direct security threat to the UK because one of, if not the largest, immigrant population in the UK is Bangladeshi. So, globalisation, no man is an island. There is a direct link between uh, 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 rising sea levels affecting agricultural production in Bangladesh and security back here in the UK. Um, the nature of climate change is insidious, it is international and therefore demands international responses. That requires a new approach to security in its broadest context. Having set the scene, I now want to look at two particular aspects that directly impact what we're talking about today in terms of disarmament and reducing defence spending. Gabriella, thank you for stealing some of my sandwiches, uh, but you didn't quite manage to steal all of them. Let me start with uh, this question of direct environmental threat of not disarming. The first and perhaps the most obvious is in weapons of mass destruction, or if you prefer, weapons of mass effect. Um, the nuclear threat, which we've all touched on today, um, um, we have something in the region of what? 2,300 major weapons, uh, uh, it, beg your pardon, major warheads held between the US and Russia more than enough overkill to destroy the planet several times over. Nuclear proliferation continues despite the best efforts of uh, many organisations and the efforts of the NPT. If there was to be, as Gabrielle has suggested, a nuclear exchange even relatively small between, say, Pakistan and India, and we uh, can all think of other countries that are uh, trying to create their own nuclear programmes, could we face the nightmare of the nuclear winter, where there is sufficient dust thrown up by this nuclear exchange to, to actually get up into the upper atmosphere large quantities of dust, which actually shields the Earth uh, from the sun and, and plunges temperatures around the world by several degrees, leading to an onset of a prolonged winter, lasting maybe 20 or 30 years. What would that have uh, what effect that have on crop production. More worrying, when that dust slowly comes back down out of the upper atmosphere, 
it will cleanse the upper atmosphere, allowing far more UV to reach the planet of the Earth. And so the nuclear winter will be followed by a nuclear summer um, whose impact upon uh, crop production would be at least as bad. Staying for one moment with the, the question of weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass, of mass effect, uh, biological warfare, rarely spoken about, is still out there and still exists. If that goes wrong, if that goes wrong. So when I look back on the, uh, the, the uh, um, ability of mankind completely to destroy life on, on this earth, for the last 60 years we have lived with this threat, and I, I take little comfort from the fact that the clock on the website of the um, American nuclear scientists has, uh, in the last couple of uh, years, been moved forward. And I believe now rests at something like four minutes to midnight. But as well as uh, the, uh, the nuclear threat, what about the threat from, from more conventional weapon systems? Um, and here, um, and uh, again, uh, Gabriella touched on this, the huge reliance upon hydrocarbon energy uh, by conventional armed forces. Most ships, uh, most warships, are either oil or diesel uh, powered. Uh, they are designed for speed and maneuverability, not fuel efficiency. Um, in the land uh, uh, arena, tanks aren't exactly really good at fuel efficiency. Um, and, and I believe the, uh, the Humvee returns something like about 12 miles to the gallon. Um, and moreover, uh, modern armed forces rely upon very large numbers of vehicles, all of which tend to be extremely thirsty. However, this pales into insignificant compared with the big one, which is air power. Uh, the United States Air Force is the largest user of hydrocarbon energy in the USA each year. Um, unlike the uh, land and the sea uh, domains where there might be alternative sources of, uh, of fuel, uh, for aircraft there really isn't an alternative that we can see at present to hydrocarbons. Um, jet aircraft, particularly when they start using reheat, are very, very thirsty uh, and they pump an awful lot of carbon out into the atmosphere. Um, we have large air forces um, around the world increasing in numbers, uh, as, as Karina's figures uh, emphasize, and therefore the carbon footprint of these is set only to increase further. Um, oh, and by the way, if you think air power is the really nasty one, uh, what about space? Um, let's all picture the uh, satellite going on the top of the rocket. Uh, what is that doing to uh, the carbon footprint? Um, yes, you can argue that there are one or two minor offsets. Um, the US in particular is looking at the whole of the energy question in the field, uh, but primarily for military reasons, because it's taking an awful lot of fuel to get fuel forward to the, uh, the, the US Marine Corps out in the field in Af Afghanistan, for example. Um, there are minor benefits, such as in the UK, Salisbury Plain, the major training area for the British Army in southern England. Uh, if it wasn't for the Army, that would now be a large housing state, probably, instead of which it's preserved as open chalkland. But come on, let's keep things in context here. Uh, the, 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 uh, the real uh, problem is that uh, these armed forces use a great deal of hydrocarbon energy and, and have a very large impact on the, on, on, on the climate. So what about the other side of the coin? Um, if we did away uh, uh, with some of these armed forces, or all of them by disarming, um, what might we be able to do with the money instead? Um, yes, I'm sure that my three fellow panellists would all have a long uh, and worthy shopping list, but I would suggest that uh, some of the cash could be built, could be spent as well uh, as uh, looking after uh, the threats of poverty by mitigating climate change. Um, uh, indirect benefits, obviously, such as confidence building um, and de-escalation of threats, not least from the, uh, the nuclear uh, division, would be of great, great benefit. Uh, but I would also perhaps suggest that the huge research and development effort that uh, armed forces uh, receive every year, if that could be diverted into mitigating climate change, we would uh, have a slightly better um, uh, hope for the future. Um, so if I just 
wrap up, because I think I've probably just about used up my time, um, a question, why do those regions that, uh, or many of those regions, most at threat from climate change, seem to be spending the most on arms? Have they actually got things right? Um, I would suggest that it's so easy to dismiss uh, as, a, uh, as a fantasy that um, we can help mitigate climate change by a disarmament programme. Uh, but the climate change threat, the new security threat, or one of the new security threats, is, uh, is so profound that it needs new and radical solutions. If we could eliminate nuclear weapons and the, threats, uh, the threat from weapons of mass effect, then the future for mankind would be immediately uh, better. But the environmental damage that armed forces do inadvertently maybe, uh, by their reliant upon hydrocarbon energy, is one that we need perhaps to uh, review. And to conclude, I would say that there is a pressing need um, uh, for climate change reasons, if for no others, to review our fundamental understanding of security and security threats and look for new, radical and innovative solutions. David. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, Again, you've touched uh, upon many, many things. Um, I think your presentation was very rich. I'm not an expert myself in energy or climate change, but I can, of course, understand um, every single of your points. Um, I wanted to say here um, a couple of things or remarks about what you said. Uh, to start with the reconceptualization of the concept of security. You've mentioned that today threats uh, are transnational, um, and I would add to that that transnational threats require global solutions. Uh, climate change does not respect boundaries. Um, weapons do not respect boundaries either, and therefore uh, we ought to address um, those issues globally, uh, not nationally, and that actually goes at the core of the understanding of security as uh, attached to national security or interests as to human security, um, and of course we know we all, uh, we're all the same, uh, whether we're in Europe or elsewhere, therefore challenges that we meet here are the same that are met elsewhere. Um, you mentioned the threat multipliers, um, and you made a comment on the impact that a nuclear exchange, even a small one between India and Pakistan, would have perhaps here in the UK, um, and although I totally agree with that, I think there is these days uh, too much focus is made on you know the Middle East, um, India, Pakistan, um, or other countries. But I, you know, I'd like to focus also on the countries that have been uh, holding onto nuclear weapons since the beginning. Um, there are still nuclear weapons deployed in Europe. Um, much to the ignorance of a lot of people who don't know about that. Um, and uh, I recently watched the Countdown to Zero movie where, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that struck me is that not long ago, a plane flew over the U.S. with, I think, six nuclear weapons on board without the pilot knowing about it. Um, what if that, um, you know, those, any of those weapons explode? Obviously, we will we would, um, hopefully not we will, we would uh, suffer the consequences here as well. Um, and to, to end my remarks uh, regarding your presentation, you ended up with a question. Um, why do those regions uh, with more poverty and uh, environmental problems continue to invest in the military? And you mentioned um, you know, how much the military these days spends in, in in fuel uh, and uh, energies that are not environmentally friendly. Um, I am sure we will get to a stage where, you know, states will invent those technologies that do not require fuel or any energy which is non environmentally friendly. So we would find ourselves with the same question. Um, so I think it is directly linked, uh, disarmament and climate change in that sense, but uh, I would like to take this forward, and when, when the day comes that uh, we see new technologies, I think we will also face the same questions as we're facing today about disarmament itself. Um, 
Right, uh, we've reached, it's 5, 10 p.m. now, and uh, we've completed our four presentations. Thank you very much to um, the four of you. I think your presentations were, were brilliant and you touched upon many things. So I think it is time for us to um, open up the discussion and the Q&A debate. Um, as I said, I have, uh, there's a few questions that we have received from the wider public. I would like to start with one but two questions, perhaps, uh, from a lady, Blanca Romagna. She writes uh, from the UNDP uh, in the border between Haiti and Dominican Republic. And I think her first question is for me, but I'll can, I kindly pass it on to you, Karina, because uh, I want to see what you think about it. It's, uh, Blanca asks that if states' military spending, armies and arms trade make war and conflict more probable, and she's taken this probably uh, from my article in Open Democracy, not from what you said. Uh, but she asks that if states' military spending, armies and arms trade make war and conflict more probable, then why governments are likely to continue with this trend, uh, despite the terrible consequences and the thousands of deaths they indirectly foster through conflict and war? And she's got a second question, which I'll, uh, I'll also add to this one. She says, and I've got it here, sorry, just one second. Mm. Yes, she asks, could building a disarmament agenda for the 21st century or working towards a globally disarmed world be added to the UN Millennium Development Goals? And I would add, what would the cost of, of that be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that one is you know, necessarily something that I can address, but I can gladly address, uh, address um, the first question that uh, that uh, she that she posed, um, I think that that at the end of the day we we sort of wonder um, why is it that states continue spending at this at the at the pace that they have done uh, in in recent years and that might might do in in future years, um, and I don't think uh, you know it's something that we we sort of questions sometimes um, as part of our daily uh, work at CIPRI uh, when we try to uh, redefine why is it that instead of setting up other type of priorities, uh, countries are still spend on their, on their militaries. And I think it's because in many, in many, I mean, it's, it's not a straightforward answer, um, but um, in many, for instance, developing countries, the militaries are still very powerful actors um, who are um, perhaps not necessarily in power in society, but with enough influence in the society or in the government to sort of set up, uh, set up the agenda on, on how to uh, design the military um, budget, for instance. Um, many militaries in the world, and this sort of, you know, links to something that uh, Jeshua brought before about the lack of transparency, many militaries in the world actually have access to enormous amount of of budget funding, uh, whether it's because they um, manage um, companies, uh, for instance, they have participation in oil companies or in uh, copper um, exploitation, like it is the case of, of Chile, clearly in Latin America, uh, or gas, um, and this gives them uh, th this this gives the military also a, a, a lot of leverage to sort of define. Uh, the type of weapons that they might buy, whether they are needed or not, because sometimes the reality is that they have the money and instead of using the money for social purposes, they buy weapons. And uh, this is one of the big, big paradoxes of our times. Um, and so I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's why they continue spending. Uh, th there is a lot of influence still, there's, there's money out there. Um, and it's also, I think a question that we would we would have to analyze on a case by case sort of basis uh, on on what is it that it's important for a government. Uh, if we look at the countries that did increase military spending this year, China and Russia, they clearly have a geopolitical uh, agenda, if you want to call it, um, by which they they are trying to um, gain leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. They are trying to position themselves as top players in the security agenda or in the military agenda. Um, 
and so the, it's also those intentions that that count uh, as to uh, try to explain why is it that they despite the financial crisis these countries can still afford this enormous amounts of money uh, in military spending does anyone else want to comment on that? Maybe Yeshua, with regards to Blanca's question uh, regarding whether we could add um, a world disarmament agenda for the 21st century to the Millennium uh, Development Goals. Uh, yes, and I'd like to weigh in on the first question as well, Absolutely. which is if uh, spending makes uh, conflict more likely, why are states likely to do that? And it's sort of in line with Karina's answer on that. Uh, again, I would say it's rampant militarism in the highest levels of human society and uh, the way in which power is rewarded. In the UN, it's got a security council in which the, the big three nuclear powers, plus two others, um, have controlled decision making. And there are several other countries who, who want to get in on that, and they are imitating that, which I think, in part at least, uh, answers Ian's question of why are people going down that path, uh, because this is how power has been rewarded in the world. Um, I don't think disarmament would need to be added to the Millennium Development Goals as a cost. Um, there are some weapon systems, especially nuclear ones, which can be complex to disassemble, but um, demilitarization of weapons uh, in many cases with uh, the conventional weapons that the vast majority of armed forces have can be demilled um, relatively straightforwardly. We've, we've got, uh, we're learning a lot about how to do that, especially the humanitarian mining movement has learned a lot about that, not just about mines, but about um, arsenals of weapons that were accumulated during the Cold War that are sitting in third world countries and they're beginning to deteriorate. Arsenal explosions have become common. So demining, uh, humanitarian demining organizations have ended up demilling a lot of weaponry, shells and mortars and other things that are left over. And they've learned a lot about doing that and it can actually be a cost effective thing. You can recover metals out of that. Um, in Cambodia they're recovering explosives out of the shells to help with the mine clearance activities and so there's recycling going on in there. Uh, and so it's not an enormous cost, such an enormous cost like alleviating poverty that we would need to add it to the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it's certainly a supportive activity, um, but I don't think we would need to act, add it to the goals. Mm -hmm. okay. um, personally, if I may add on to what you said, Karina and Yeshua, um, when it comes to military spending on states, I think uh, the reason why they continue to do that is, is very complex, obviously, and it is um, an addition of various uh, variants or tangents or variables, if you want to call it. Um, and I would uh, highlight four. Um, some of them you've already mentioned that, Karina. Uh, the first one, I would say, it is the fact that military or militarism continues to be seen in, in international politics as a tool of power, um, as a means to an end. Um, when it comes to codifying, uh, I mean, the UN Charter attempts, attempts at uh, codifying that uh, militarism uh, and the use of force is not uh, or should not be uh, a, tool, a tool or a means to an end. Um, that will get within time. Uh, we're, still, we're still not there yet, I would say. So that would be the first one that I would highlight. The second one is a pervasive, and we've discussed this uh, throughout the past hour or so, the pervasive understanding um, from states and governments that uh, security is based on national security and interests. Uh, we cannot, uh, you know, I don't think we should adopt a reductionist uh, outlook here and uh, put it all on economics, saying that it is all about economic interest and the military industrial complex. I think there is still a pervasive understanding of security based on national interests and security. Um, the third one is economics. We've already mentioned that. Uh, I don't want to go further into that. Uh, and then I would, I would add a fourth one, inertia. It is very difficult to change things when things have, this is the way things have been done for decades, 
I would say, centuries um, in mankind. So I wanted to, to add that one. Um, now, I have uh, some more questions that have actually arrived while we were discussing. Um, one of the questions that has been addressed um, or asked is by Lauren Dickey, who's in the Scrap team, actually. And uh, this, Gabriella, would, uh, I think the question, you are the best place to, to answer this. Um, the, the question is, recent UN reports from South Sudan suggest that civil disarmament can lead to, if not further exac exacerbate, human rights violations. Uh, what do you suggest for ensuring that disarmament and human rights don't clash? Uh, could you repeat the, the question? I'm sorry, I, it, I yeah. think my internet is a bit... Yeah, no problem. Um, recent reports from uh, the UN um, in South Sudan or regarding South Sudan suggest that civil disarmament can lead to, if not further exacerbate, human rights violations. Uh, what do you suggest for ensuring that disarmament and human rights don't clash? I think the question um, has to do a lot with whether, you know, what, it, what is it that increases security, militarism or disarmament? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I think once again, I would emphasize the whole um, isolation of subjects. Um, I think that we should look at it from a holistic perspective. So look at disarmament and human rights together. Um, and I think that asymmetrically doing that in peace processes or in conflict um, affected uh, areas, that would um, reduce these risks that the question entailed. Um, I'm unfortunately not um, um, a, an expert on South Sudan, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm, that's all I can say. I think that the, uh, having a discussion, discussing both these topics together, see that Yosha can answer this better, maybe, um, will, um, will help this forward and make that it doesn't uh, collide. Thanks, Gabriela. Yosha, you wanted to add something onto that? Yeah, actually, um, some of that information came from a small arms survey project, which is the baseline security survey in Sudan. Um, and uh, it's a very specific situation where uh, authorities in one area wanted to disarm one group, and they felt threatened by another group, which was not disarmed. So it was like selective disarmament, and certainly that won't work. Uh, the group felt like it was being made more of a victim. Um, so... Uh, there definitely has to be balance in that, um, and that would be true on a global level as well. Um, so um, it was a very specific situation in Sudan where authorities were trying to disarm one group but not another, and they felt threatened by that. Interesting, interesting point, Yesha. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I have one question here, which I think it's very interesting, not only because of the contents of the question, but also... Uh, with regards to who this comes from. Um, Teresa Diaz Morera from the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation um, says that uh, the ministry would be interested in, in, in us elaborating further the notion of general and complete disarmament. What does that mean exactly? Um, and I know, Yeshua, we uh, actually discussed this on Saturday. Uh, so I'm going to give the lead to you, and maybe we can all comment on that if that's okay. Sure, I'll be brief to uh, let the other panelists weigh in. Um, general and complete disarmament is, to a certain extent, a historical phrase. It comes from proposals by uh, the Russian and uh, U.S. governments, in particular in the 1960s, uh, for the total dismantlement of the world's militaries and the, uh, the shift of uh, that monies to human development. Um, that has become almost a mantra in um, UN documents today. It tends to get tacked on to documents, uh, virtually every document uh, relating to disarmament, leading to general and complete disarmament under international uh, control. Um, and so it's just added on, but it comes from that historical framework. Um, and it's almost difficult to imagine today 
the situation that we had in the 1960s, um, which was seen as extremely hopeful by many of the recently decolonized governments in the world, where the military powerful countries and some of our most respected and learned diplomats were all talking about global disarmament. Um, for the, the newly independent countries, they saw that this was a way in which they wouldn't have to go down that track of buying arms. And the non-aligned movement um, kept that line for a very long time. And to a great degree, they felt sold out by the fact that that disarmament never happened by the uh, economically uh, um, advanced countries. Do you think that... Um by using the word or the line general and complete disarmament across the board, it has lost meaning uh, over time. Um, something I, I come across very often when I, when I talk about scrap and what scrap proposes, uh, it is, you know, is general and complete disarmament is utopian. Um, and to some extent, people don't really understand um, what it is, what it means, what it entails, what are the contents of it. Um, in, you know, operationally, would that mean getting rid of uh, all weapons across the board? Um, would that not actually lead to more insecurity than security? Um, I think this is the underlying question that a lot of people have with uh, general and complete disarmament. I don't know if uh, Gabriella, Karina, or Ian want to add anything onto that. Um, but if, uh, if not, uh, I would say that general and complete disarmament is not getting rid of all nuclears across the board. It is about uh, putting ceilings to conventional forces, um, getting rid of nuclear weapons, that is the top one priority, I would say. Um, it entails uh, confident security building measures, increasing them. Um, it, would it would leave untouched internal policing, of course. Um, and uh, there is another question from from the audience uh, made by Anais de Mulder from Belgium who asks whether general and complete disarmament would actually be uh, linked to or is linked to the notion of collective security. Um, I think that's an important point and I think to some extent and to a great extent it is. Um, after all, general and complete disarmament is the, one of the motors of the uh, UN General Assembly and um, although collective security is not included in the UN Charter, I think it is also one of the aspirations. Um, and again, I think it is directly related to the, the notion that Ian was mentioned before about um, global or transnational threats needing or requiring global solutions. Um, now I have one more question uh, for you, Ian, um, from Lauren Dickey, she asks, um, uh, let me just scroll down a little bit. Doesn't want to scroll down. Um, yeah, um, Lauren asks, should larger countries, um, in other words, countries with greater emission levels, be held to a different standard in the process to disarm? Uh, how exactly will smaller countries with lower pollution emission levels fit into the picture? Well, I would say the problem with uh, trying to answer this question is uh, looking at uh, Durban uh, last December and the attempts at uh, keeping the Kyoto Protocols alive and taking them forward. Um, we, act we actually went backwards. Um, and we seem to be making less progress than we ought to be with this whole question of, uh, of uh, um, cutting emissions. Uh, the EU is um, taking a global lead with uh, initiatives such as the 2020 initiative and, uh, and very much um, uh, to, to uh, the, the forefront. I think before you can even start to link the question of um, uh, disarmament with emissions, I, I think you've got to uh, look at the, the question of emissions in the first place. I, th I think trying to make it even more complex and more controversial than it already is by trying to link, the, link disarmament into this is just one step too far. Um, I think this is one particular uh, uh, elephant in the room that we're going to have to take little bites out of rather than trying to swallow the whole thing in a single sitting. Mm. Thanks, Ian. 
Um, Gabriella, Yeshwin, Karina, if you want to add anything, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll give you um, the micro. Um, I'm picking up questions as, as they arrive and as I see them in our um, document prepared for the occasion. Uh, there is one question by uh, David Santoro, uh, who writes from the CSIS Pacific Forum in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, he asks, to what extent disarmament, particularly nuclear disarmament, is seen as a priority on the international security agenda? Uh, how important is it is, or is it in, consider in relation to other issues? Um, I think this, uh, we, we can all answer that question somehow, uh, but I don't know if Gabriella, if you have anything to, to say on that, since you are you know, usually at the UN monitoring uh, what's happening at the conference on the settlement, where the discussions lay uh, in that respect. Or more monitoring what's not happening. Yeah. In the <laughs> Good point, yeah. Um, and that also answers the questions a little, a little bit. Uh, it's not highly prioritized, I think, uh, in the UN. Um, well, it, no, let me rephrase. It is highly um, uh, prioritized by the non-nuclear weapon states. Um, but since, uh, as we've heard before, the nuclear weapon states are the ones that are sitting in the Security Council. Uh, if you look at the Conference on Disarmament, which we monitor, it works by consensus which is now these days used as a veto right. So um, as long as the nuclear weapon states don't want to disarm, they're not, there's not going to happen anything within the UN on nuclear disarmament. Uh, if we look out in the public, um, I, think, I, think David, I think you mentioned it before, that it's not widely talked about. When I go around talking about working with nuclear disarmament people, look at me and think like I'm a, a crazy person that mm -hmm. works, that, something that I should have been working with in the Cold War mm -hmm. uh, when I wasn't even born. But, uh, so I don't think, unfortunately, there, there is um, enough light that's being shed on this. Uh, and I also think that's why, once again, to come back to our Reaching Critical Will's view of this, connecting this issue uh, to other issues that the public think is more important, like lack of um, he uh, health care and food and water and so on, will increase um, people's knowledge that this is still a big threat and it's important to deal with. And that would also put more pressure into the UN and uh, hopefully make a difference. I don't know if that answered the question. I think it did. Um, I would personally... I see a lot of talk um, out there about proliferation or nuclear proliferation rather than nuclear disarmament. Um, having said that, um, I think one should not take lightly um, statements coming from uh, governmental officials or even world leaders. Um, to what extent uh, President Obama's speech in Prague in 2009 um, it is a real commitment to nuclear disarmament um, is something that we could spend hours debating. Um, personally, I don't think all is about rhetoric. Um, I think there is a, a significant uh, compromise there towards reaching that goal. Um, but it is, it is quite daunting how that uh, statement or uh, initiative is sometimes being instrumentalized um, by others to actually shift the attention to proliferation rather than disarmament, as if pleading for disarmament could actually strengthen the proliferation regime itself. Um, I think it's worth uh, bearing that in mind. Um, now a further question from the audience. Um, Adria is a Adria Caro, a Spanish lawyer. He writes from Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. He asks, how is any agreement um, on disarmament, uh, or how would any agreement on global disarmament uh, control the governments that sign it, that they actually comply with their disarmament obligations? Um, you mentioned earlier, Jeshua, about the episode in South Sudan where a faction 
had disarmed, the other one had not disarmed. Could we see this at a, you know, on a global scale? I'm not sure that it's a comparable situation. I would prefer to go with something like the Mine Ban Treaty, which we monitor at the Landmine and Cluster Munition Monitor. I mean, that's the purpose. We, we both monitor the compliance by states to the agreement. Are they fulfilling their obligations as well as looking at what's happening in the, the states that have not yet joined the treaty? Uh, and so far, we have not found a, a single country that has been using anti-personnel mines that join the treaty. They are used by governments that haven't yet joined the treaty and mostly by non-state armed groups. Mm. Um, there's a certain, um, the, the power in treaties is that um, the, the, the governments that sign up to it uh, do not want to be seen as violating their obligations. So there's a certain trust factor there. Um, it, it has to do with legitimacy in the world today. Now, is that a strong enough power to keep someone from doing it? Well, the other part of the conventions are they destroy the weapon. And I consider that to be the real ratification because it's required that they destroy their stocks uh, when they, uh, they join the convention. They have a period of time to do that in. But once they do that, even if they desire to use it, they don't have it anymore. And we've essentially shut down the entire global trade in it there's almost no production anymore except in India and Pakistan. Um, so um, the convention has been very successful. Um, and it looks like we're on track to, to do the same thing with the other humanitarian disarmament convention, the one on cluster munitions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the best system that we have at this time. Is it foolproof? No. Um, our monitoring system uh, also helps because they know that there are groups looking over their shoulder uh, unlike some other conventions where uh, there is non-governmental compliance, we're accepted as a member of the convention, even though we are a non-governmental entity. Um, they accept that we're doing better monitoring of the convention than they could do on their own. So I think very good monitoring by groups, transparency efforts like uh, CIPRI, Reaching Critical Will, are extraordinarily important at building trust in these types of international agreements. Ian? Yes, I just want to, we're, we're apologies to Gabrielle. Yes, I am old enough to remember the Cold War. Uh, but just picking up on something that uh, uh, Yeshua referred to earlier, uh, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. Um, here we are still in the Cold War, still um, with this horrendous threat of, of, of global nu nuclear warfare uh, across the inner German border, perhaps, uh, as, the tr as the trigger. And yet the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, if you wish, um, and NATO uh, agree that they are going to decrease the amount of uh, conventional armaments in Europe. And despite the tremendous levels of distrust between uh, the Warsaw Pact and the NATO, the treaty is a success. And uh, there is open and verifiable monitoring of reduction in, 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 uh, in conventional weapons. If we can achieve that, um, when you've got um, the, the, the huge threat between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, I think there's a great cause for optimism. And perhaps that um, is, is another lesson from history, that it can work, as well as the excellent examples that Yeshua has just given on the contemporary world. Mm, thanks, Ian. Um, Yeshua, may I, yes, Gabriella? Yes, can I just add something from the, you know, uh, from the Conference on Disarmament? I do believe, if you look at the Conference on Disarmament and the lack of work that's been going on for the last 15 years, um, and how they put effort in not to proceed in negotiating a nuclear weapons convention or anything that could uh, lead to disarmament, I do, if you want to look at it from a positive side, do believe that um, this shows that states want, they're even, they're even, uh, they don't even want to discuss discussing these issues of a nuclear weapon convention and so on, which for me shows that there is some sort of sacredness that if there would be a nuclear weapons convention, even though if you wouldn't sign, it would still create a norm like we've seen uh, with other uh, disarmament treaties. Um, create a norm not to use the weapon or to disarm. So I do believe that even though the 
we have the uh, flaws of international, uh, international law that sovereign, sovereign law is stronger. Um, I do think that states, um, if there is a treaty there, they want to uh, apply to it. They don't want to be, like Josha said, they don't want to violate something uh, that strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this question, perhaps, uh, Karina and Yeshua are best placed to address it. Uh, what do you think will the impact be of the arms trade treaty in current military spending and arms transfers, of course? Hmm. <laughs> Would it be an impact? Um, it's it's hard to say because the 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 arms trade the negotiations for the arms trade treaty um, are not necessarily calling for um, reductions, for instance, in military spending or anything uh, on those lines. I think I think they are trying to introduce. Um, better controls, you know, that, that, uh, that you know, to make uh, states more accountable in, in this regard. But when it, when it comes to the links or the, the, the relation uh, with military spending, I think that one, um, one way perhaps or one tool that we can utilize to sort of monitor whether this can work or not is, is against, you know, uh, uh, transparency. Whether, for instance, you know, one of the big issues that we have here at CIPRI is whether the states give enough information about the type of arms procurement that they do. Uh, we know that there's a lot of arms exports and arms um, imports, right? And we actually have one of the largest databases, if not the largest database, on uh, you know registering uh, this this type of transactions. But sometimes finding those transactions, you know, reflected on a budget, is a total different story. I mean, these these uh, these in in some cases are hidden from the budget, or they are um, they have a specific clauses of national security exception, uh, not to disclose this information. So. Hopefully, you know, um, the, the, the treaty might, might bring some, some, some um, room for improving transparency when it comes to reporting this type of, um, uh, of, of uh, transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeshua? Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, like Karina said, no, I don't think it's going to have much of an effect on, uh, on military spending. The goal of the arms trade treaty is not to halt the arms trade or to ban the trade in arms. It's to put conditionalities on it, most of which are human rights conditionalities because of the um, enormous amount of uh, human rights abuses which are enabled by people with arms in, in many countries. Uh, so that is the driving force behind the arms trade treaty. The International Peace Bureau fully supports the negotiations of an arms trade treaty, and it could bring an end, or no, it won't bring an end, but it could reduce a certain type of human suffering. Um, however, there's a trend that we haven't talked about yet that I think is a real threat, uh, and that is autonomous weapons. Um, this is a coming threat that I haven't seen much work on yet, uh, also known as robotics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a revolution in military affairs that's going to drive a new, a new amount of purchases. Uh, and I see this as a real threat for sucking up yet more resources that we need for other purposes. Ian, you want to say yeah, something? can I just um, uh, jump in here? Um, uh, Yeshua raises a, a, a really worrying point, and certainly it plays into uh, some of the stuff that I was investigating uh, shortly before before I left uh, the military a couple of years ago. This whole question of autonomous weapon systems and, ro and robotics is really, to me, very, very worrying. When you have a weapon system that's going to discriminate uh, based on ones and noughts, rather than a person in the loop, it's really quite frightening. Don't be fooled, we are there already. Uh, within the uh, British um, uh, weapons uh, uh, system is a system called Brimstone. This is all open uh, source reporting. Uh, Brimstone can uh, be fired off and go and seek its own target based on pre-programming. Um, this, to me, is really worrying. When you look at the whole question of robotics, the only work that's ever been done on 
ethics of robotics is I, Robot by Asimov, a work of science fiction, and all the, you know, all the thinking about the ethics of, uh, of, of, of robots and autonomous weapon systems relies upon a piece of science fiction. Wow. Yes, um, thanks, Ian. I'm glad that we actually addressed the issue of robotics. Um, I think it is something uh, we had scrap at looking into that as well, um, because, uh, as I said before, when it, when, with regards to Ian's remarks on the use by the military of uh, not non environmentally uh, environmentally friendly uh, energies, uh, we will see in the future more and more the use of drones and other robotic type of uh, weaponry and um, armory. So I think we need to bear that in mind. It's, a, it's a, a dear concern. I have one final, I think uh, we're fast approaching the end um, of the webinar. I have one more question um, for you, Karina. Um, you're, at CIPRI, you, you do research um, uh, on military spending for Latin America, South Asia, and uh, Africa, or the Middle East, sorry. Um, does any, I mean, based on your research, do you have any, or how do I put it? Um, when you look at defense uh, spending by region, is there one particular region that gives you uh, reasons for hope? And is there one that gives you reasons for serious despair? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the, the region that it is starting to give me a little bit of hope is Latin America, mm. um, or, or, or I would say South America, um, mostly because South America has, has come a long way tremendously in improving transparency, for instance, uh, to report uh, their military spending and also to report their, their um, arms acquisitions in the region. And, and at the level of the UNASUR, which is this new a body created um, a couple of years ago, they have um, recently implemented or, or approved an instrument similar to the UN Register on Military Spending, whereby each country member of the UNASUR would send annually a report um, with um, a disaggregation of all their military spending. Um, this is a tool of transparency, this is a tool uh, of confidence building, um, and I think it's a, it's a really good positive step for a region um, that uh, two or three years ago people were talking that uh, uh, there might have been a, an arms race going on. So, so this is the, an extremely positive step. And, and the hope is that actually this initial, um, this initial uh, uh, jump that all the states are having with, with this instrument, the UNASUR instrument on military expenditure, I hope that it lasts because sometimes we have seen, uh, even at the international level, that many of these uh, regional or international treaties or instruments are very much um, executed at the, at the very early years, but then eventually they become obsolete. So hopefully, you know, the, the UNASU one is going to continue. Um, one region that, that uh, perhaps is, is uh, concerning for, for the opposite reasons uh, for me specifically is the Middle East, given the, the, the lack of, of uh, data and transparency that we have. Uh, the Middle East, uh, I don't know if you, if you are aware of this, but it's the region with the largest um, share of um, GDP uh, in military spending, right? So while, while the average in the world is around uh, 2%, uh, in the Middle East is, 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 it tends to be on the, on the really high side. Uh, uh, there are countries in the Middle East that spend up to 10, 14 percent of their GDP in military spending. Um, it's a it's a region where th that's very volatile. It's really volatile right now, uh, not only because of the Arab Spring, but but also because of of, um, of the um, allegedly um, Iranian uh, nuclear program uh, and and lack of transparency in these issues create even more distrust among the states and and, and it's a and it's one of the reasons why sometimes the states race into and, and, and jump into increasing military spending because they don't know what the neighbor is doing. And so the easy answer is, uh, okay, I'm going to increase, I'm going to buy more just in case my neighbor is doing the same. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a region that uh, I, I follow very closely because, because, again, lack of transparency is, is causing um, 
um, more distrust um, in, in a region that it's already historically very conflictive. Um, so I would say that those are the ones. North Africa as well, we need to start watching what, you know, how, how, how the Libyan army is going to be built from scratch, you know, whether, whether the neighboring countries are going to feel any threat or not from that situation. Um, it's, uh, it's a region that it's, uh, it's posing, you know, many, many questions as well when it comes to, to transparency. Um, so I would say, I would say those, those are the, you know, the two phases of a, of a very similar situation that, that at the end of the day comes to this issue of transparency. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Karina. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Middle East because I think it is uh, a very good example um, where it reflects one of the uh, debates uh, around uh, disarmament itself, which is uh, what is the sequence for disarmament or um, divest in, in military uh, spending? Is it first security and peace and then disarmament? Or does disarmament or can disarmament lead to uh, disarmament related initiatives uh, lead to more trust, um, more confidence in the security uh, of the region? and ultimately to peace. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if, Yeshua, you want to add something to that? Um. <laughs> okay, um, right, we're fast approaching the, the end um, of the call. And um, before I draw uh, the webinar to a close, I want to mention or say a few words um, um, disarmament is not easy. Um, I will not cease to repeat that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this here when, you know, if we look back, uh, disarmament started centuries ago, and uh, in the modern times, it started with the conferences of The Hague uh, towards the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. So, yeah, I will not, repeat to, uh, I will not cease, sorry, to repeat it. It's not an easy task, um, and uh, that we know. We know about that. Uh, here we've sought to address some of the key issues um, facing and challenges uh, facing disarmament and how disarmament is directly related to other fields such as development, uh, human rights and, um, and uh, climate change. Um, the questions that we have received um, and discussed here today plus those that we've not had a chance to read because frankly I had more questions there but uh, I'm afraid that if I go into them, uh, we would go over the allowed time uh, for the call. Um, touch upon some of the very key challenges that disarmament faces today. Um, further, I mean, disarmament is not about, or disarmament and militarism is not about who is right, who is wrong, I would say, um, or who does better and who does worse. Uh, surely those defending militarism uh, have their own reasons and believe they're in the right side of the coin. Um, the same applies to disarmaments and anybody working in peace. The way I see it personally, uh, there are two potential outcomes uh, to the current trend of militarism. Um, either perpetuation, conflict perpetuation, war and more injustice, or disarmament and with it less uh, conflict, less war and more justice. Um, I think it's a matter of choice. Um, so I want to ask uh, for those who are listening, which of the two outcomes uh, do we prefer? Um, and finally, well, I want to thank uh, the speakers uh, today, uh, Gabriela, Yeshua, Karina, and Ian for joining us um, on the Scrap GDAMS webinar. Um, I want to also thank anybody who has taken part in the Global Day of Action on Military Spending. Um, I think it is a great initiative and uh, I'm glad that this is happening and hopefully it will happen again uh, next year. And uh, finally, uh, a big thanks to the Scrap team and to all of you out there who have been uh, listening and sending questions through um, our social media and uh, other channels. I hope that you follow that you will follow Scrap's activities and steps uh, as we progress towards uh, our goal um, for general and complete disarmament. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.